played smart. Young Commando, let's go! A brand new start. Young Commando, let's go! But I want to fly. Young Commando, let's go! Get me! This is the Live your best life every day with the Smart Network. Hutch, go smart.
start. Janko, Mango, let's go. But I want to fly. Janko, Mango, let's go. Give Great a try. Make your best life every day with the Smart Network. Hutch, go smart. Okay, can I don't know what you're
Good morning, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, chamber post budget uh, discussion. Uh, on behalf of Ceylon Chamber, I will thank all of you uh, for joining us. Today, uh, we have with us a very eminent panel that we have brought uh, to you to uh, analyze this uh, budget and uh, discuss the implications arising, uh, both ta tax and non-tax, non economic issues uh, that is there. Uh, so how we will conduct this session is uh, at 9.30, we have Mr. Suresh Petera, uh, Principal KPMG, uh, who will talk to you uh, about, the, he will run through uh, with his presentation on the analysis of the budget proposals. Then we have uh, Dr. Kapila Senanayake, uh, Director General of Fiscal Policy of the Ministry of Finance, uh, who will uh, give the policy side of it, the policy build up, the policy framework behind Budget 2022. Uh, thereafter, we have brought you a very eminent panel to talk to you, uh, none other than our own chairman, Mr. Vishkun Sami, uh, who will take uh, the view of the membership, the chamber, the economy in general implications arising from the budget 2022. And then we have uh, the CEO uh, of the Hemas Group, uh, Kasturi uh, Wilson. Kasturi, he talked to you about the uh, impact the budget has on uh, business because the, her company represents diverse sector and she will talk to you about the impact the budget has or has not had uh, on the business uh, community uh, in general. Uh, then we have Deshal Dimel. Uh, I don't think Deshal is reduction. Deshal is an economist, and Deshal was in, uh, involved in the Ministry of Finance in the last uh, three or four years under the previous government. And uh, Deshal is an economist by profession, and uh, he will discuss about the economic impact ranging from uh, deficit financing to exchange uh, issues we are facing and what solutions lie ahead of us. So I think we have covered a broad spectrum. Uh, through these uh, panelists and for the benefit of membership. And thereafter, we have a <clears throat> chat box also. Uh, if there are any questions the audience has, you can uh, send those things uh, in the chat box. Uh, during the session, uh, I think our administrator will keep all microphone, all, all mics and mics on mute and switch off the camera. So I hope the administrator will control that. And uh, with those few words, uh, let me once again welcome all of you and our panelists and good morning to all of you. And may I now hand over the session to Suresh Perra, uh, who will take you through uh, an analysis of the budget proposals 2022. Over to you, Suresh. Uh, thank you, uh, Duminda. And let me begin by uh, thanking uh, the chamber for inviting me to do this presentation this year. And I do have a set of slides, so I will share that uh, uh, slides. And then, uh, yeah, then uh, I will let. Uh, Then I will uh, take you all through the, the salient features of the budget. And right, I, I hope everyone can see my uh, screen. Yes, can see Suresh. You want to go to slide right, mode? Right. Or slide mode. Sorry. So you're on slide mode, right? Full full thing can be seen. Yeah, okay. correct. Yeah, fine. Okay, fine. So what I will do is uh, in two slides, I'll give you the key revenue proposals uh, in a nutshell. And thereafter, I take the, the key ones, uh, the, about four, four of them, and go into details, right? So, in this slide, I have given, uh, I have collated uh, the slide uh, the proposals uh, from the tax perspective, which impact copper rates. And uh, special GST that was introduced uh, last year, uh, implementation date uh, was announced, 1st of uh, January 2022. And then uh, there's a 25% surcharge tax uh, that has also been. Uh, introduced and this is uh, almost similar to the super gains tax that we've seen earlier. We'll talk about it uh, more later. And then uh, there's a social security contribution 2.5 uh, that has been introduced also in relation to companies, uh, persons uh, over 120 million turnover per annum. And uh, the rate of the financial debt, which is, uh, which is at 15% right now, has been increased to 18% uh, by 3% uh, for a period of one year. And of course, uh, like every year, we do find uh, uh, excise duty revisions have also been affected in relation to liquor and cigarettes. 
so in relation to VAT, uh, there are two uh, new exemptions uh, that have been introduced uh, with effect from 1st of January. As we all know, basically, normally the indirect taxes or the import duty levies uh, are with effect from uh, the midnight of the budget speech date, whereas uh, the VATs are basically from uh, 1st of January, from the beginning of January. Uh, and then there's also a reference to submission of digital invoices uh, and documents. Uh, I think uh, it's a welcome uh, welcome move to uh, introduce the uh, or the intention to introduce the digital invoices concept because this is something that most of our clients have been uh, requesting uh, for. And then uh, in this slide, I collated uh, some of the proposals uh, may not have a direct impact in relation to a corporate, but uh, maybe as individuals, uh, we do get affected uh, by this. Okay, there's a fee that has been uh, proposed uh, to charge a motor vehicle that is uh, meeting accidents and also, uh, if you modernize, modify, or upgrade your motor vehicle, again, uh, there's a fee that has been proposed. So I suppose if you change your seats, maybe you go for leather seats, or maybe you install a GPS system or some, some something of that nature into your vehicle, I think that there's a fee to be uh, paid. I'm not sure, sure how this uh, collection mechanism will be or the implementation uh, will be introduced in relation to this, uh, though the charge has been uh, explained uh, or charge has been proposed. And in relation to uh, uh, reg reg motor vehicles that are not, motor vehicles and motorcycles that are not uh, registered, which are basically I would say unauthorized motor vehicles and motorcycles is the term used in the budget speech. There's amnesty period that has been uh, mentioned. Uh, within that amnesty period upon payment of a penalty, uh, you can get registration. And also, uh, as we all know, there is there's a whole lot of motor vehicles uh, stuck at the customs, uh, and those motor vehicles are to be released upon payment of the normal duties and the taxes and uh, a fine. And there's also a reference to a license, uh, license to be issued, license fees to be collected. Uh, on account of uh, introduction of uh, leisure zones in, a spe in special areas. So more details uh, we keep our fingers crossed to see. And also with regard to the Telecommunication Regulation Commission also, there is a proposal to auction, auction these uh, licenses. And as you all know, TRC uh, is uh, in charge of issuing uh, licenses uh, for telecommunication services, tele uh, telephone operators, so that both fixed and mobile, and internet service providers and satellite broadcasting operators. Uh, so there's to be a licensing, uh, auctioning of the license uh, system. I do have a slide in relation to this uh, with regard to the relevant act governing this uh, thing. We will have a look at it at that point. Right, so this is the main one I think everybody will be uh, talking of 25% surcharge tax on uh, to companies that uh, have more than 2 billion taxable income in relation to year of assessment 2021. So this is uh, surcharge tax is uh, nothing but uh, super gains tax uh, in another name and we are used to this one. I think uh, the Honorable Minister I mentioned that there will be about uh, 63 or 62 companies that may get affected in relation to uh, this. Now what I've done is in this slide I've given a quick uh, comparison between what we had in 2015 super gains tax and the 25% uh, surcharge tax. Now, rate is all is same, 25%, 25%, and uh, imposition is uh, also on the same uh, category, individuals and companies. And the distinction, the difference what we see is uh, in relation to threshold. Uh, the earlier threshold was uh, reference to Profit before tax, so it's from the audited accounts. Profit, profit before tax uh, over 2 billion for year of assessment 13 14 uh, was the threshold, whereas uh, now the threshold is taxable income. So, taxable income, the tax profit exceeding 2 billion for year of assessment 2021. So, that is where the difference we see, and it's the, the payment is basically 25% uh, uh, on the taxable income in both under both schemes right now in the earlier scheme uh, there was a reference for the payment to be made in three installments uh, in the budget speech we don't see uh, that statement here but i believe when this uh, act is uh, legislated there will be details coming and now what uh, I'm, I'm just uh, refreshing your our memories uh, 
when the uh, SGT is su super gain tax was there, this is not in the budget proposal, this is the past, uh, there was another rule in relation to group of companies. In relation to group of companies, uh, the rule was uh, if the aggregate PBT of the group was more than uh, 2 billion, every company had to pay. So if let's say five company, uh, five member group, and uh, one company was making losses, the other company was let's say below 2 billion, but uh, other three companies are uh, higher than 2 billion. So as a result, the aggregate is uh, above 2 billion. Uh, so if that's the case, each company in the group uh, had to pay. And then uh, in case of a company where the group, group PBT was, uh, aggregate group PBT was uh, below 2 billion, only the companies that exceeded 2 billion had to make the payment. So now this rule uh, I mentioned because uh, sometimes when the act is drafted, there is a possibility that this may also be uh, included uh, just like the case that was there earlier. Right, 2.0% uh, social security contribution, the other major one, what is this one? Uh, the government is expecting 140 billion and to me basically this looks uh, nothing more than uh, uh, reintroduction of uh, turnout but for the nation building tax and NBT, which was at the rate of 2% and uh, the threshold at that time was uh, 12 million and that 12 million is going up to 120 million. Uh, and when we look at the body of the budget speech and the uh, technical notes, uh, there is a bit of a question mark whether this uh, 2.5 million is uh, on the Turnover, the whole turnover above 120 million or only the upper slab uh, over and above the uh, 120 million will attract this 2.5% social security contribution because uh, when you look at the wording you can uh, interpret it in both ways but I think uh, intention seems to be the upper slab but uh, let's uh, discuss this one. Right, I'm just again refreshing the memory when the NBT was there who had to pay NBT? Uh, importers, manufacturers, service providers, and wholesalers and retailers, and then the exemptions were there in relation to exporters of goods and services, pharmaceuticals, and so so many other ones, right? And in relation to the financial services, we have to keep in mind NBT was charged only on the value addition. So now, this 2.5 percent would this be levied on a bank uh, on the top line, or whether there will be a DV, uh, how to say, a provision to say that, okay, what is a turnover in case of a bank and give a different uh, definition or maybe to adapt what the uh, NBT base was for, uh, used to be, basically what the NBT base uh, used to be. Again, I have refreshed your memory with regard to the definition of uh, turnover under the NBT Act. Uh, importers, it was a value for the VAT and in case of uh, manufacturers, it used to be sums receivable whether received or not and in relation to the service providers also the same definition and in relation to wholesalers, sums receivable whether received or not from the sale of any article, the same definition. So this definition that will be couched into the enacting legislation, enacting uh, enactment, the law, the act will be very, very important deciding this. Uh, liability calculation. Right. The other key one that affects uh, financial is the financial VAT. As we all know, financial VAT is at 15%. The proposal is to increase the rate up to 18% for a period of only one year, right? Only from 1st of Jan to 31st December 2022. And paid month, that is nothing new because they are right now also under the current system, the payment is monthly. And uh, there's a reference in the budget speech saying that the tax should not be passed on to the customers. Now, whether in practice, the uh, intention of the government is good to include this uh, statement into the budget speech, whether this will be uh, practical, we need to keep our fingers crossed because uh, a bank has the right to charge a bank charges. Uh, and uh, whether there will be an impact on the customers, uh, we have to keep our fingers crossed to see. I believe it's each bank's policy uh, that will govern that. And uh, financial debt, of course, is uh, not deductible in calculation the taxable income. It's already there as a uh, prohibited uh, item in arriving at the taxable income. Now, in relation to the other two taxes also that we discussed earlier, the 
it's a good question to see whether those uh, amounts will be deductible. Now, what is the governing rule in relation to that? The rule is basically under Section 10, give the prohibited deduction in arriving at the taxable income. And if it is to be uh, prohibited in deducting deduction for, for deduction to be prohibited, uh, there has to be a gazette, and in that gazette, that should be specifically mentioned. So, in the absence of the uh, absence of uh, the tax, whether it, uh, previous taxes being mentioned in a gazette, uh, that will be deductible. But whether it will be prescribed uh, is something that we need to keep our uh, fingers crossed. Right now, I'm going to uh, uh, highlight uh, an important point. Right now, this. Uh, 3% incremental uh, uh, rate in relation to financial VAT is specifically mentioned as for a period of one year. Now, in 2009 also, there's a story. There was, when the NBD was introduced uh, in the budget speech uh, at that time, I can recall, uh, this is exactly the words from the budget speech in 2009. Uh, it was introduced uh, only for a period of two years. And that two years uh, from 2009, it went on till uh, recently 2019 or the end of 2019, 2020, uh, the continuation. All right. Uh, so two, two minor uh, examples. Now, what we have to keep in mind is in this budget, we don't see a single uh, proposal or single amendment will have to be executed to the Inland Revenue Act. Uh, because there are no proposals. I think the first time I have seen something uh, of this nature. And uh, in relation to VAT also, right, so the VAT Act will have to get amended uh, in to increase the uh, rate. And uh, exemption schedule will also get uh, amended in relation to uh, these two exemptions that have been introduced. So import and supply of uh, medical equipment, uh, machinery apparatus, so there's a whole stop here. I will, I'm not going to read this. Uh, there's exemption introduced. It was already there also. Now, the prominent thing in relation to this is surgical and dental instrument uh, instruments were also included in the earlier wording. Now we do find that uh, surgical and dental instruments uh, part is not captured in the wording uh, included in the budget speech. So what is the impact? The impact is uh, supply or import of the surgical and dental instrument will get exposed to uh, VAT. I don't know whether it's a typo, whether it's a oversight. Uh, we need to keep our fingers crossed again to see whether uh, what is the exact wording that will go into the amendment to be introduced to the uh, list of exemptions in the VAT Act. Right. Now comes the uh, crucial one, the special GST. Now we all remember special GST was introduced or mentioned in the uh, previous budget uh, in relation to five areas. Now what is the special GST? When we look at India, we can see uh, GST was introduced as a consolidated tax to uh, in, in substitution of multiple taxes uh, that were in different areas. So, but for that, uh, India took a long time to come up with that system. Now, this I, th I believe the policymakers may have uh, obtained got this idea uh, from the experience in India. So, the idea is basically to simplify and also uh, make it convenient for implementation. So the, uh, how do I say, the thought process is noble there. But uh, having said that thing, implementation of uh, surgery of this nature to the Sri Lankan uh, tax regime is not that easy. So now what we have been told is this is going to be uh, effective from 1st Jan 2022. Uh, and the law has already been drafted. That's what uh, we hear. And there was also a reference, uh, I think, few day, yesterday or so, basically in relation to multiple rates uh, that may come in relation to this. Now, the areas that were mentioned in the 2021 budget speech, motor vehicles, cigarette, legal telecom, betting and gaming, uh, and those, uh, the current tax, uh, taxes to be replaced by the special GST, and that's what was uh, mentioned. Now, I've just given you the overview of the current taxes applicable to in these areas. Now, we do have to keep our fingers crossed whether these uh, areas are the targeted areas or whether there will be other areas as well. There is no reference to the reference to that in the uh, budget speech. But if the laws have been drafted already, I think uh, it may be confined to these areas. I don't think uh, uh, it will go out of that. 
Right, the miscellaneous ones, uh, uh, the budget proposals, now the, what I mentioned uh, at the beginning itself, there is a proposal to uh, auction licenses issued by the TRC. Now, what do we find in the Telecommunication Act of uh, Act number 25 of 1991? Now, it's a section 17 that empowers or lays down the procedure for issuance of licenses. Now you can see according to this uh, section, the process is uh, a recommendation must go from the TRC to the minister. And when this uh, recommendation is made, minister can either go by the recommendation or minister has the power to uh, use his own discretion and uh, issue the licenses uh, according to his direction. He is he, he, not bound by the recommendation coming from the uh, TRC in relation to issuing these licenses. Now, this is, some, this is one of the salient features that we find in the Telecommunication Act. So now, where do we bring in the uh, auctioning uh, process here? So is it the TRC that will uh, uh, conduct the auctioning process uh, in order to select the winner and then uh, make the recommendation to the uh, minister? Or is it going to be under the hands of the minister that the recommendation, sorry, the auctioning process that will be conducted to see So something that uh, we have to keep in our mind as to how it will happen. Right. Now, as I mentioned, basically in every, on every budget, uh, on every budget day, uh, midnight, uh, we do find a, a series of uh, gassets being issued in relation to the import levies. And uh, this time also no difference. Uh, different and we do find uh, those uh, gassets and I collated uh, some of the changes in those gassets uh, in relation to the cigarettes. Now, as I mentioned, the budget proposal uh, budget proposal was to basically uh, revise the uh, rates in relation to liquor and uh, cigarettes, two different extra go governing these two areas. One is the exercise ordinance, that's the liquor, and the exercise uh, special provisions act, the cigarettes. Now, other than in relation to cigarettes, other than uh, how do they the small ones, the ones that are below 60 millimeters in length, uh, you can see the second line here. The, the second line here. Uh, if it is below say, 60 millimeters, we do find a uh, post budget, there is a reduction here. Whereas all the others, uh, basically, they are all increased. Now, these rates are given in relation to uh, 1,000 cigarettes, right? So you, you do find an increase in relation to all the other categories, but in relation to this category, the, spare, the special, the unique thing is there is a uh, reduction. Right, so when it comes to liquor, uh, also in relation to liquor, basically everything is uh, going up. There's nothing uh, coming down here, and I won't go into the details. Uh, also, the these two basically uh, that is basically uh, malt liquor no duty uh, no duty and that's again uh, if it is being supplied to diplomatic missions uh, existing rule that has been repeated and also no duty on liquor exported uh, that is also an existing rule that we find repeated in the cases that has been issued so right so in a Shell basically those are the key prayer proposals in relation to Pali in relation to the budget proposals. Now we have to keep in mind budget proposals are basically only proposals. Now this is the there is a legal process. Basically uh, appropriation bill the, is was presented on the 7th October and what we call as the budget speech, what we call as the budget piece in fact is the second reading of the appropriation bill itself which happened on the 12th November. So Thereafter, there's a process that uh, this budget, these proposals have to go through. There's a second reading uh, happening, uh, second reading happening on these dates, that is up to 22nd November. And then there's a vote to be taken uh, at 5 p.m. on the 22nd November. Thereafter comes the committee stage amendments. Now, this is where basically, uh, in case we want to make any amendments or whatever that we need to get, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, activated. Uh, and that committee stage debate uh, is all going up to 10th uh, December and the final vote uh, reading is happening on the 10th December. So after this date, uh, 
we can say the budget has been passed in the parliament. But what we have to keep in mind is just because the budget gets passed in the parliament, that does not mean that any of these uh, proposals become get the uh, enforceability in the eyes of the law. To uh, give the legal enforceability, the relevant legislation has to be amended. That's something we have to keep in mind, other than the gases that have been already issued. So if there's a, there has to be an amendment to the VAT Act, uh, other two, this, what do you call the special con the social contribution levy, the law has to go through. We still we have not seen the bill, though we have we understand basically that draft uh, the law has been drafted. That has to go through the normal process and get uh, certified by the speaker, uh, etc. Right. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. Passing of the budget is not uh, conclusive. It has to go take the normal uh, procedure for uh, passing these laws. Right, Dumind, I think uh, I covered uh, uh, the key proposals uh, in this presentation and we can uh, discuss the details uh, once the panel discussion uh, commences. So over to you, Dumind. Yeah. So uh, thank you very so, much, uh, Suresh, for that. Very much, Suresh, for that. Excellent presentation uh, covering uh, all aspects uh, of the uh, uh, revenue proposals. Uh, so next, our next speaker, is uh, Dr. Kapila Serenayaka. As I told you, uh, Dr. Serenayaka is the Director of Fiscal Policy at the Ministry of Finance. And Dr. Serenayaka, uh, uh, I guess, played a large role in, in, in behind the policy uh, frame of the budget. Uh, so now I have the pleasure of uh, inviting Dr. Serenayaka to address this uh, gathering. Uh, and uh, we have allocated due to 10 to 15 minutes. So Dr. Serenayak, within those uh, time they allocated, uh, I'd be most grateful if you can start your presentation. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Duminda. Am I audible? Yes, can hear you, can hear you, yes. Um, thank you very much, and also the I think uh, Mr. Sores uh, explained uh, in details about the uh, tax proposals and other uh, other proposals in the budget. Uh, so this is uh, I will give you just a brief on the uh, budget 2022, and I think uh, all of you have uh, read the budget speech. Uh, with that, uh, it's with great honor that I deliver the keynote speech at uh, National Budget Webinar organized by the uh, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this is the one of the uh, key discussion forums of National Budget. I thank the Chamber of Chamber for organizing this forum continuously and uh, creating a platform for policymakers like us to hear responses of the business community for the budget 2022 just has been presented in parliament. I'm pleased that I could be here today remotely to deliver the keynote on the salient points of the budget 2022 and I thank you for this uh, great opportunity. Budget 2022 presented a series of policy, revenue and expenditure proposals with the objective of overcoming the various challenges that, uh, that is grappling the economy unprecedentedly at large, led by the uh, repercussion of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's not uh, belongs to Sri Lanka, but it's across the borders. The budget proposal intrinsically set the path for reducing the social and economic disparities, accelerating achievement of uh, sustainable goals, enhancing reliance against climate change, adopting to emerging conditions posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, and effectively managing public finance. Uh, one of major aspect is the uh, fiscal con consolidation. Fiscal consolidation that is enhancing government revenue 
and rationalizing government expenditure while keeping the necessary expenditure intact and increasing expenditure where necessary is at the uh, heart of the budget proposals. From the anticipated budget deficit of 11.1% as a percentage of GDP in 2021, that is this year, is expected to reduce, the, uh, reduce to 8.8% in 2022 and 6.1% in 2024 and 4.8% uh, in 2025, with the ultimate objective of having a balanced budget in 2028. So this is our very uh, ultimate goal, having a, ba a balanced budget in 2028. Since November 2019, government has taken a number of steps to create a simple, transparent and effective tax system, and it is still there. So it's uh, there's no any harm to that uh, system. Through increasing tax threshold and reducing tax rates, especially in, on income tax and value-added tax, this tax reform catered to small and medium enterprises, facilitating to diverting their savings to further investment. In addition, tax exemption and tax holidays were granted to a number of sectors, including agrofarm, IT, and enabling services. However, the expected benefit through the government tax policy of enhancing investment, boosting emerging sectors, and enhancing production were overshadowed by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Nevertheless, it is believed that these reforms acted as the fiscal stimulus provided for the industries, especially SMEs, as a way of reducing their tax burden. In addition, the, govern the central bank has given uh, monetary policy stimulus uh, by reducing uh, interest rate since beginning, uh, since March 2020 onwards. Now they have tightened this, their in, uh, monetary policy. Uh, proposal introduced by budget 2022 are complementary to the tax policies adopted by the government. The one time tax of surcharge tax focus on companies and individuals that have earned high profit despite the effects of the pandemic where the VAT on financial services increased. It increased from uh, 15 to 18 percent. The social security contribution is uh, aimed at allowing the industry to join hands with the government in its efforts to rebuild the Sri Lankan economy affected by the pandemic. Although these tax proposal may add to the tax burden of certain companies temporarily, it is understood that this proposal will aid the government in enhancing their tax revenue for next year and position Sri Lanka to co cope up with my rate of fiscal challenges arising from the pandemic. In addition, excise duty on, uh, as explained uh, Mr. Suresh, uh, excise duty on cigarettes and liquor were increased. Further number of proposals relating to non-tax revenue, including auctioning license for telecommunication services, issuance of leisure license, and proposal on motor vehicles were introduced, we are going to introduce, Further, new startups are facilitated through exempting business registration fee for next year and consolidating fees levied by various institutions on business registration. The budget 2022 also highlighted the initiatives to further enhance tax administration by the uh, government that would lead to reduce tax evasion and opportunities for cor uh, corruption in revenue agencies while further facilitating taxpayer. These initiatives primarily rest on digitalization of the revenue process at these revenue agencies. Along with these, along with the above initiatives to enhance government revenue, number of 
uh, proposal focus on expenditure rationalization are going to implement. Uh, while increasing the various subsidies offers to the public, public expenditure rationalization focus on members of parliament and executive officers of public service. This included extensions of tenure for eligibility of pension of members of parliament for five years to 10 years, cutting down of full allowance of MPs and government officers and reducing telephone allowances. In addition, electricity allowance of government officers are to be uh, reduced. The construction activities in government offices are to be suspended for two years. So this is, uh, those are the kind of uh, expenditure management and also the rationalized uh, expenditure proposals. A number of other reforms on expenditure management was also introduced, as such as the issuance of quarterly warrants instead of annual warrants, and preventing requests for supplementary SMEs by the ministries. State-owned enterprises, as you all know, this is a burden to the government, uh, were also subject to a number of new reforms under this budget. This include only providing state-owned enterprises with capital allowance instead of recurrent expenditure and enhancing their business focus and financial discipline, facilitating, facilitating better asset management of SOEs uh, in order to uh, make them uh, competitive and profitable. While reducing public service related expenditure by cutting down unnecessary expenditure. Proposals are also targeted increasing the efficiency of public service. Monitoring of all infrastructure development projects will be decentralized and procurement will be modernized through e e procurement. While expenditure was rationalized, focusing on increasing the efficiency of the public service, increased public investment was directed to uplift the production economy. Proposal focus on creation of new product investment zones, covering a number of uh, different sectors of uh, like production of organic fertilizer, pharmaceuticals, raw materials for textiles and apparel uh, industry. As you already know now, the government has already started uh, fabric park at Rao and also the pharma at uh, Hambantota, rubber industrial production, export-based agro-processing, livestock, agriculture equipment and machinery, fisheries and IT and all these uh, sector industries. Further investment will enhance the diversification, the value addition, promote SMEs at regional and district level at, and facilitate to shift from small scale production to large scale production. While reducing such outflows through imports through export competing production. In this regard, expansion of international market oriented production of fruits, vegetables, fish based products, liquid milk, and commercial crops, spices, enhancing necessary knowledge of flower, uh, flower growers in the context of growing flowers and foliage for export market, promoting local handloom and batik industry to become USD 1 billion earner by 2025, enhanced in Sri Lanka shares of gem and natural mineral resources in the global market, promoting Sri Lanka as a center for wellness tourism and establishment of New Ayurveda treatment centers are recognized as key strategies. I think you have uh, read this uh, budget proposal or the budget speech already. I think you are well aware of these uh, proposals. Further, agriculture sector will be facilitated through a Green Agriculture Development Act, while investment in agriculture focused on promotion of 
usage of alternative weedicides, promoting the use of organic fertilizers, introducing new agricultural technology, developing fisheries and aquatic sector and livestock sector. In addition, high-tech agroparks will be established, which will provide new agro-entrepreneurs by providing uncultivated lands in agriculture and plantation sectors. Uh, in addition, uh, allocation will be made for traditional cottage industries and textile industry, including uh, hang, loom, and batik. Infrastructure development will focus on ensuring access to water, development to irrigation facilities, road, renewable energy, housing, uh, covering state, urban, and rural areas. In addition, as one of key development priorities of the government, rural development is at the forefront of budget proposal with the focus of on livelihood uh, development, common infrastructure, environment and sustainable development, and social welfare and social development of the rural sector. Uh, further investment will focus on conservation and environment, including forest and livelihood. Um, education infrastructure and the health sector and also the um, public security. In addition, the government mentioned expenditure item focus on uplifting production economy. Uh, government will provide relief to those who are affected by the pandemic, including micro, small and medium scale and businessmen school van owners, three wheelers, private bus owners, and other special sector that lost income during the lockdown. In addition, prisoners will be provided with improved sanitary facilities. Senior citizens and persons with special needs will be provided with necessary facilities at village level. And patients who went missing will be compensated. The nutrition basket offered to pregnant mothers and relief basket to alleviate the high cost of living will be offered to facilitate vulnerable segments of the society to uplift their economies amidst the economic pressure on the pandemic. In the same vein, women entrepreneurship will be promoted through establishment of mini supermarket chain for women entrepreneurs called Home Shop, which ensures that food security of rural people through homemade products and by linking with the main supply chain. I think as you already know that earlier we had a very uh, established cooperative uh, system uh, in our, I think, uh, early 90s or 20s. Now, uh, this is the uh, one sort of advancement of that concept. Budget 2022, therefore, present a well thought out series of proposals that understand the economic condition of the present day and attempts to address the issues surrounding such condition. As you know, the, we have this uh, now inflationary pressure and also there is a foreign exchange issue and uh, we have the high fiscal deficit. Uh, so enough pressures are there. However, as discussed, it does not undermine in any way the relief that should be provided to the general public and has also accommodated the demands of the public service, especially of teachers and principals and pensioners, while strategically reducing unnecessary government expenditure. So those are the uh, key uh, revenue and expenditure proposal in order to contain uh, fiscal deficit over the years. It is expected that the business committee will recognize that the, this condition under which the government were made, especially the new tax proposal, and we hope for their continued cooperation to the government in achieving the overall macroeconomic targets and macroeconomic stability of our country in order to provide inclusive growth that was 
established, articulated in the budget 2021. Thank you and greatly appreciate for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank, you uh, thank you, Dr. Sirenaika. I know you have a very, had a very busy schedule. You have to finish some other session and join us. So I hope you will remain with us for some time to take some questions and answers. Yes, thank you, Doctor. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have heard from uh, Suresh Perera on the uh, synopsis of a synopsis of the budget on the implication of the large beyond taxation. Uh, Dr. Serenayaka gave the policy framework behind the budget. Now, we want to talk to our private sector experts who are with us. Uh, may I first turn to the Chairman of the Law Chamber, Mr. Vish Kuzi Sami. Uh, uh, Vish, <clears throat> Uh, my first question is to you to ask you. Uh, I know it's a tight rope that all of us have to walk, and especially the chairman of the chamber has a very tight rope uh, to balance both the government's uh, agenda uh, of uh, tightening fiscal deficits and foreign exchange crisis. At the same time, the business community also must function for us to have a sustainable uh, and equitable growth. Uh, so, how do you see? I mean, taking these two sides of the view, uh, what is the position or what is your view of budget 2022? Has he addressed the concerns of our business committee and our membership? At the same time, how do we balance the government's needs? Uh, thank you, uh, Dominda. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, yes, can, can, can. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, you know, since Friday, you know, we have had the opportunity to meet with uh, several of the government officials. And, uh, you know, uh, on behalf of the chamber, I have taken up the position saying that, uh, you know, we appreciate the fact uh, the government has stated its course on policy consistency when it comes to the existing taxes. So I have uh, publicly appreciated that, and I'm sure the membership appreciates that as well. We have also appreciated the fact uh, bringing in some... Um, uh, digital uh, activity into uh, reducing uh, the time taken at various levels, uh, especially after the COVID, it has become necessary. So hopefully uh, we will be able to see action on that uh, quickly. Uh, the single window concept that has been spoken about many a times, but I think uh, it has been uh, told with a little bit more vigor, uh, and I hope uh, that also uh, will uh, work correctly. Um, Unfortunately, um, you know, we uh, there was, I mean, I must appreciate again, uh, the attempt to reduce uh, government expenditure uh, by way of uh, reducing some uh, telephone, fuel expenditures, etc. But having done that, uh, having gone and increased the retirement age to 65, um, you know, I'm not sure uh, what that's going to uh, give the government. And at the same token, um, uh, asking for 50,000 uh, new cadre to be taken into the government. Uh, in this day and age, uh, I would like to have seen a reduction in government than increase in uh, government and public uh, sector expenditure. So those are uh, serious concerns uh, for us, uh, especially at a time when uh, increasing revenue for the government uh, is going to be a, a serious challenge. Uh, the two uh, big taxes, uh, one is the uh, super tax or the surcharge that has come in. Um, I guess it's a necessary evil uh, because where else are they going to get it? But uh, I hope, uh, you know, uh, uh, like Mr. Kapila Sen and I have said, it will, they will go into the details of this and make sure the tax base uh, that they're going to come up with is equitable. And, uh, you know, not, uh, you know, uh, it is across the board and not just after a few people. Uh, the two and a half percent social security tax, of course, is a serious concern. Uh, and I'm sure the chamber will take it up with the minister and the ministry officials, because there are lots of businesses that have a huge uh, revenue base, but they work on an extremely thin margin even sometimes below 2% uh, margin, uh, especially if you take uh, some of the uh, fuel distributors who have uh, fuel sheds, uh, you know, even pharma distributors, uh, so many uh, distributors, uh, businesses are on very, very thin uh, margin. 
So if you take two and a half percent on top of that, uh, basically that system would collapse. So I'm sure um, that that has to be uh, addressed. Um, I, and I must appreciate the fact that um, you know the Secretary Treasury addressed uh, on looking after the vulnerable, uh, the small timers, which is the three wheeler drivers, the school vans. Um, et cetera, even the event managers, uh, there is some money allocated to them. It's good. I just want to make sure it's not going to be a dole out. Uh, you know, we have to make sure these monies are put into that system to better enhance those services for the future. So I think the, how they do it is more important uh, because if it's just a dole out, then it's not going to help anybody. Um, and uh, the, the uh, continuous taxation on the financial services, uh, only because we had a good financial system uh, in the banking sector, were we able to be able to withstand the pressures of COVID because they came out and was able to extend the monies to the sectors that struggle. Um, and, uh, you know, they're continuing to service those sectors. So if you keep on hammering them down with taxes, at some point in time, it's going to collapse. So that is also another thing that we have to be extremely careful. Yes, it is a large revenue uh, sector, uh, but we have to do it with uh, caution. Uh, so those are my um, thoughts, uh, Duminda. If there are specific questions, uh, I'll be able to answer. No, I think wish you did it very, very uh thoroughly and explicitly and to the point. Uh, so thank you very much, Vish, for expressing those views, uh, giving both the uh, both points of view uh, and uh, touching on all aspects uh, uh, of the budget uh, as affects the private sector. So uh, my, uh, may I turn the next question to Desha? Uh, uh, Desha, uh, I mean, you, you have been involved in, in this function for some time, and I know how difficult it is when you're on the government side and how easy it is to be critical when you're on the other side. I mean, any one of us, right? So, uh, given the uh, you know the macroeconomic vision they gave with regard to uh, reducing the deficit uh, from 10% to 8.8% by end of this year, by end of next year, uh, even the revenue targets that have been given is about 50% increase from what we are having now, uh, and then the uh, increasing the uh, Revenue to GDP from what nine percent, twelve percent. I mean, those are lovely if you can achieve. But I mean, because the budget has been prepared based on those expectations. So, how practical are these uh, targets given by government uh, compared to where we are now? I'll touch on the foreign exchange crisis first, but I want to talk about the, uh, the fiscal side first, which you were asked what your views are. Yeah, uh, thanks, Duminda, and thank you to Ceylon Chain before inviting me to speak today. Um, yeah, no, I think you're, you're right in terms of uh, the the ambition, the level of ambition in those targets, right? So I think it was clear from the beginning that this budget did need to um, establish a path of um, of greater fiscal consolidation. Um, what the markets would look for, particularly the the global uh, the global credit rating agencies, the global bond markets, etc., uh, would be the the credibility of the proposals that have been made. Now you touched on revenue, and you're right. There is a I think a 46 percent. Uh, expected increase in uh, in garment revenue um, in, by 2022. Now, if you take out the proposed new measures, right, the proposed new measures, uh, the, the three big taxes bring in about just under 340 billion rupees uh, or expected to. If you take those out, even without that, the rest of the revenue base needs to grow by about 26% to achieve the the expected uh, revenue target. Now that is that is quite ambitious, right? It's, it's typically you would see the revenue base growing in line with nominal GDP. Nominal GDP should be uh, basically your inflation rate plus your real GDP growth rate. A 25% target for that debt, I think is um, is very ambitious. So I would think that it is likely that we'll fall short of um, of the revenue target. So if you recall, even in the 2000 uh, 21 budget that was presented last year, expectation for revenue was about 2 trillion rupees. Um, and the revised estimate for 2021 is about 1.56 trillion, right? So we are about 25% short on that as well. And this is again, uh, it's it's been a, a systemic issue. Successive governments, successive budgets have always estimated revenue. Um, what typically happens then is that as the year goes by, um, the government would cut back on, on capital expenditure. 
Now, there's not a lot of room for cutting back on the uh, on the uh, the recurrent expenditure, um, as we all know. Uh, but capex is likely to 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 come to come down a bit, and there is some space for that. So I think the budgeted figure for capex is about 930 billion rupees, which is substantial, um, and that is that is likely to be uh, to be cut back by you know, a couple of hundred uh, hundred billion. But still, for all, I would think that given the stickiness of recurrent expenditure, uh, the likely decline in our uh, in our revenue compared to what we're expecting, um, I would think we are likely to hit another double-digit budget deficit in 2022 um, as well, unfortunately. Um, and that probably won't be perceived in the best light by uh, by rating agencies. Um, and uh, if, you know, I mean, one of the big questions that we're trying to solve in this country is how Sri Lanka can regain access to global uh, capital markets, to global credit markets, uh, not just the sovereign, but the banking sector um, as well. Um, and that the, the, the ability for the budget to kind of set out a credible uh, fiscal path is a crucial element in that uh, in that entire equation, especially especially for the credit rating agencies. Um, so I think we may have fallen short a little bit uh, on that front uh, in terms of the expectations of this budget. So what you're saying is it's very really optimistic. Uh, the targets are very optimistic and uh, rather than unrealistic. Yeah. Side. Yeah, I would think a 8.9 percent budget deficit would be would be good if you can achieve it. Um, I mean, I mean, I say good. I mean, in terms of the ambition of the the reduction, um, but I think it's going to be very tough to achieve that, given the the ambition of the revenue target and the stickiness of Sri Lanka's expenditure in general. Thank you, Shah. Come back to you on another question after I talk to the rest of the panelists. Uh, my next question is to Kasturi. Uh, Kasturi, uh, you know, we talk a lot about government policy, uh, deficit financing, to uh, foreign currency, everything, and there are a lot of theories behind trying to come the articles. But you are someone who's in the thick of it uh, because you have to run your business, uh, a large conglomerate on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Uh, you have to, uh, you know, deal with foreign exchange issues, tax issues, in addition to growing your business. Uh, so in, in overall context, uh, how do you view the current situation? Uh, of uh, challenges you are facing in your business and this budget ready to resolve them or make the situation worse for you. Sorry to put you in a tough position. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Raminda. So um, I'll, I'll try to address it from a general. Um, so we we are in manufacturing, we are in uh, imports um, and we are not in exports, but we're in product and service. But generally, what are the challenges any local company who is in these areas, what are they facing? The biggest uh, challenge for the last maybe couple of months, and it got worse in the last three, four weeks, is the access to uh, currency for us to do our business, whether you are importing raw materials or finished goods. Um, given what Deshal said, I guess the budget did lack uh, clarity on how you are going to get access to more capital to improve our reserves. Um, and um, from a domestic um, conglomerate point of view or, or a manufacturer point of view or importer, we, we don't have any clarity of that problem being solving. And that's the biggest problem we faced currently. Um, how do we have access to our line, credit lines? How do we um, open up and import our goods and uh, products we want to import to continue our manufacturing uh, businesses? So that's... Um, a challenge and while that big challenge continues and we didn't see that addressed in particularly in detail or, or even alluded to maybe because the central bank governor had a six month roadmap which he had just announced then you come through the taxes which the um, private sector has been um, put in uh, at least imposed on uh, yes uh, like um, Deshal did say that's going to have about um, out of the increase in revenue that's about 50 percent of the increase in revenue um, the big problem I see is even if you're a manufacturer or an importer, uh, whether it's uh, low margin business or even in the manufacturer's high margin business, to get the product into the hands of a consumer, there are many players in the value chain. Now, when you come up with this 2.5% um, uh, tax on social security, 
it is a huge impact too for the small margin businesses. When you're talking about small margin, like Vish did mention, the fuel, uh, you have uh, you have businesses like bunkering and trading bar businesses. Um, you also have uh, imports like pharmaceutical, which is on done on a very small margin from the importer's perspective as well. And down the value chain, um, uh, distributors, whether it's a locally manufactured product or imported product, gets about 5%. And it, it's it's through their margin and definitely it won't be viable. Um, the other aspect is there are con products which are under price control. And when you have price control and this, uh, it, it definitely doesn't seem viable. It won't, I, I don't think they need to think through this. How does this uh, uh, translate to the impact to the consumer? It translates to the intermediaries. I mean, you have SMEs who are intermediaries and this would mean that they would be put out of business for sure. Uh, if you are trying to increase the margins down the value chain, it would may to accommodate this. It will anyway have a cascading effect on on the consumer. While there was an intention, and we appreciate the fact that the tax consistency has been remain has been there, adding complexity to a private sector by bringing this kind of a tax, which is cascading effect, and the administration not only even in on our side in the state side. I think it's going to create a lot of inefficiencies. It may be in one way we could have looked at it is just increase the VAT um, rate just one off for a year just to accommodate or in, uh, increase the revenue. So this thing, this tax is a single big problem we will be facing in terms of uh, a making the viability on certain businesses which are low margin as well as on the consumer's higher side how it, it goes and impacts. Of course, um, the 25% charge, um, I wouldn't touch too much on it, uh, which did touch on it. And the basis um, looked like previously there were tax free companies who were not impacted. They, they have to think through the basis and um, technically um, a company which has 1.9 billion versus a company which is 2.1 billion. And it's it, 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 it there's a stark uh, uh, inequality there when you try to uh, try to address it. So those things they'll have to look through. Um, so you, we also from the private sector we see that there is intention to uh, encourage certain industries and increase uh, economic activity. The the red tape being moved out is a or intention of easing up red tape is a uh, is a good uh, uh, direction. It's a view in a good direction. Um, but you also have digital coming in uh, like the single window for customs, uh, the intention on the hub, um, the, the free port. There is no clarity. The problem here, Duminda, is we've seen this in consecutive budgets. I think I've seen the hub and the concept which Sri Lanka should have done long time ago. The intention has been put in every single budget, but we've somehow not been able to execute. And the I think the problem is to get a hub, you have to get many stakeholders to get the uh, from the finance. It, uh, it has to become a, not only a logistic, it has to be a financial hub, um, aviation hub, maritime, and a goods and services hub. You need to get that. And and whether we have the ability to bring multiple stakeholders to work towards this is is a challenge. So, um, and then on on few industries, they are putting out incentives to encourage domestic production and move into a production led economy. Um, I've seen um, agri they've explained about organic fertilizer and then pharmaceuticals. Now pharmaceuticals has been there in the budget before. And we have domestic manufacturers, including us, who have put in huge amount of investment into this. The ads, I think what needs they need to do is clarity on how this works, because currently the private sector who have invested sees a lot of volatility in terms of how the buyback agreements have been honored. So what we need to do is to move a level up and the government has to have a strategy in how do you get these um, manufacturers together and who does what and how do you enhance the pool of products you manufacture versus stick to the same pool and say you, you kind of say one person takes Today I give you this buyback and tomorrow I'm shifting it to somebody else. That consistency is needed and that transparency is needed. Um, and the clarity is needed if you want more investment coming into pharmaceutical. And I think self-sufficiency and getting pharmaceutical industry going up, uh, in, uh, uh, more improving is important, but this part of it has not been addressed and that has to be addressed if you want more investments coming in. 
Um, yeah, that's mostly the side, but the one last thing is the, it's uh, why the private sector is being taxed and we are saying that you need uh, uh, to contribute towards the revenue and actually be socially responsible towards citizens who are vulnerable. That's perfectly right. I think what we have don't see is the state sector's intent on how they're going to be productive. You can see financial planning has been brought in. They are curtailing some expense. It can be one off, but the fundamental structure and how they are going to be more efficient because they're consume a lot, consuming a lot of our taxes. Right? And, and they are not going to be efficient and you're adding more graduates into it, 50,000 graduates into an inefficient system. You're talking about a long term unsustainable state sector. So that has not been addressed. And I think while private sector puts is also willing to contribute then put their share in state sector has to be uh, uh, be also responsible and not only on capital expenditure curtailing it is more on the operating expenses and being more efficient and mandated to be proper. Thank you Kastor. I think you did it uh, very well comprehensively. So Dr. Kapil a lot of things for you take from the lady uh, as to uh, what issues the Privacy is facing, uh, and then how, where you need to put your mind to address some of those issues. Dr. Kapil, I'll come to you uh, after asking a question of Suresh. Um, uh, Suresh, my next question is to you. Uh, I'm getting more into detail on tax that you presented. Uh, uh, is this super gates that offered? No one knows, Suresh, how uh, the formula will be, how it will be uh, tax, etc. Uh, but you know, over the weekend, I'm just going to some of the uh, accounts of companies that may have reached 2 billion and uh, some of them have dividend income that has come in, uh, which has already been taxed. Uh, I mean, their profit has already been taxed by the declaring companies. So uh, principally, should the dividend also should be accumulated in deciding the taxable income of 2 billion? Yeah, so basically this formula has to be specified in the law. So the policymakers will have to take a call as to how to uh, define this taxable income basically for the purpose of the uh, purpose of the super gains uh, or the surcharge tax but uh, from the perspective of uh, inland from the perspective of uh, uh, inland revenue calculation of the taxable income uh, you it depends according to the type of the dividends and if it's an exempt dividend then basically it's not included in the taxable income but if it's a dividend that has not suffered uh, withholding tax and then that is uh, included and thereafter basically there's a formula that has been given already to uh, deduct the expenses and thereafter to uh, deduct the losses and then the, uh, the the normal formula that will be applicable during the year. so if it's a foreign dividends basically again uh, you do have the uh, substantial participation uh, concept coming in then it's going out so depending on the type of the dividends uh, there I'll come back with the other question after I talk to Dr. Kapila. Dr. Kapila, I'm, I guess you are there, right? Uh, uh, Dr. Kapila, my next question is to you. Uh, that is, um, you, know, you have heard the panelists discussing uh, on numerous uh, issues on policy and tax. Uh, we know that you have to uh, sort of a walk a very tight rope in, in it comes to Decide a fiscal policy and uh, as government revenue and how you don't overtax uh, the business community. Uh, See, so the question is that you know, we had a system of taxation with income tax at 28%, uh, a PAY system of tax administration, uh, with only tax system, uh, there will be VAT of 15%, and then uh, NBT, all that. So, I mean, with good intentions, the government. Uh, reduce some of these taxes, abolish some of these taxes, uh, allowing economic expand. But then again, after doing all that in in a year or in in a six months time of law passing, you bring a different tax entirely called super gains tax. You bring a equal NBT. So the question that is asked is the rationale for this ad hoc taxes. Why abolish it at the beginning in, 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 when the system was very well established? Uh, any answers you can give to that question, Dr. Kapil? Shiran is Dr. Kapila uh, in? 
think he's dropped out at the moment. Uh, then we'll so go ahead and we'll get him back. Okay, so let me know when he comes joining. Okay, so I'll come back to Dr. Kapila when he joins the meeting. So uh, my next question is to uh, Vish. Uh, Vish, <clears throat> I know that you have made, uh, uh, I mean, before the budget was drafted, the policy was done uh, on behalf of the chamber. Uh, you represented the chamber and met the ministers, uh, met the governors, all that, and you know, uh, made the chamber's case uh, as to how uh, the taxation exchange situation could be managed. So, in that context, uh, do you think that the submissions made by the chamber uh, have been responded to positively, uh, and how successful that engagement has been, and what subsequent space we have for that engagement with the government? Vishu, can't be heard. You're on mute. I think uh, we have had a good, good um, uh, attempt at uh, convincing the government. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, representation that we made personally and in written form uh, to the Honorable Minister with regards to the budget, a lot of the items uh, meant about, uh, you know, maintaining consistency. So I think in that part, uh, it has been done well. Uh, we have also uh, requested uh, to increase the ease of doing business. So uh, when it comes to that also, I think lots of things have been proposed. We just have to wait and see. I think we have uh, established a good grounds to continue to lobby with the government. Uh, they are willing to hear. Uh, but I think as a business community, we also uh, must be able to go with solutions than only problems. Uh, you know, we can state our case, but we also have to go with solutions. So that's the approach the chamber will be taking. Uh, while we state our problem, we will also uh, take some solutions and see if we can get it implemented. Thank you, Vish. Uh, my next question is to Deshal. Deshal, the most pressing question at the moment the country is facing is the uh, foreign exchange uh, crisis. In terms of lack of dollars, in the market go to their normal import business. As you know, uh, a large sector of economy has come to a standstill because of the lack of foreign currency in the market to purchase their goods. Uh, then also this uh, requirement to uh, convert dollars has come in. Uh, and then of course the debt repayment uh, that we have to make in the next year. So this actually is the primary concern of the business community in general. Uh, do you think the uh, budget I know budget is more fiscal, not uh, it's not monetary policy and foreign currency policy. But looking at the budget, have you think that you do consideration with the aspect? And even if you have to touch outside the budget, what is your uh, economic view outlook uh, as to how Sri Lanka can navigate the next few months uh, in this crisis situation? Uh, thanks, Timothy. I, I'll come to that. I just want to uh, touch a little bit on the issue of stability that a few panelists have spoke on. Um, and I'm, I'm going to differ from what uh, what we sure, sure, yeah, 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 a, yes. a couple of others have said as well. So, so I think the entire objective and the idea of the new government in 2019 with the new tax policy, where substantial reductions were put in place for uh, VAT, corporate income tax, personal income tax, et cetera, um, and saying that this is going to be established for the next five years. The whole objective of that substantial tax structure change was to provide uh, a sense of predictability and a sense of stability for the business community. Now, the problem is that when you have a reduction of your revenue by effectively three and a half percent of GDP with those reductions in the taxes, the outcome is that you then have to keep bringing in this kind of one-off uh, super, uh, super uh, what do you call it, uh, the surcharges, one-off increase in financial VAT and so on, um, which is really the opposite of your intended outcome. Right? You intended to have stability, but what you actually create is a degree of uncertainty. So now when you have a, a one-off uh, surcharge for this year, or for 2022, a, a one-off increase in FinVAC for 2022, again, the business committee will be wondering, okay, in 2023, what's the new measure that's going to come in that's going to be required to, uh, to address the revenue shortfall in that year? So I would think that be, it would be uh, probably superior to actually revisit those, those fundamental taxes, corporate income tax, VAT, um, particularly in things like uh, thresholds uh, and then smaller adjustments to rates, 
uh, withholding taxes like in, uh, WHT on interest income, WHT, uh, the, the PAYE, those, uh, I think a reconsideration of that will certainly be better in terms of instilling stability and instilling a, a longevity of the tax regime rather than the system that we have now where we are compelled to bring in these one-off taxes from time to time, right? So I would just differ from a couple of panelists on the way that we would perceive stability in that sense. Yes. Now, coming to your question yes. on the uh, coming to your question on the forex situation. Um, so again, I would I I, I I can't agree that it's not a fiscal issue, right? So I, certainly there are important monetary aspects to it, but I think the fundamental driver of that instability is a fiscal problem. So here again, if you look back at what has happened, it is really with the with the expansion of Sri Lanka's budget deficit. Uh, and again, a lot of countries have gone through the same problem during the pandemic. But Sri Lanka's starting point was much worse, right? So our deficits have gone to double digit levels, whereas other countries have may, may not seen that same magnitude of, um, of, um, of weakness in fiscal position. So with this weakening fiscal position, our credit ratings obviously were downgraded by a couple of notches. Uh, and that has, that has prevented us from being able to access capital markets. Uh, and, that, and therefore, we've used our reserves to be set to settle uh, all our maturing liabilities. Now, in that context, it is, this is why we are having so much difficulty in terms of releasing foreign exchange or releasing reserves to meet our uh, uh, required payments on whether it's on the import side, um, any other outflows, and that's significantly affecting our supply chains and so on. So really, that fundamental problem is still, fisc is still fiscal. Um, but like, I mean, I don't expect but markets probably don't expect Sri Lanka to come down to a 5% uh, budget deficit in one year. But what is important is that budgets are able to spell out how we reach that target over the medium term in a, in a credible manner. So again, one-off tax measures is not really going to convince markets that this is a sustainable path towards a, 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 a reduced budget deficit in the, in the medium term. So I still think that the, the budget did have an important role in terms of anchoring that credibility. Uh, that would then enable ratings to be re-rated, and that would, of course, then allow the sovereign to be able to uh, refinance uh, uh, debt in um, uh, refinance its maturing debt. It will also enable uh, the banking system to be able to have better access to its uh, financing lines as well, and that is really the critical factor in terms of addressing this uh, this liquidity issue. So I, was, I certainly think that the budget did have a role to play, it, and it probably fell short a little bit in terms of how we could uh, address that problem. Uh, thanks, Ashan. You know, just one more question arising from that uh, is that, you know, a lot of people are saying we need to increase our export of goods at the basket and take it to $20 billion by 2027. Uh, how do we ex increase exports? Is it a private sector led growth strategy or should it be a combination of government identifying and giving the necessary uh, framework for them to do? How, how does it really work? How have the countries done this kind of thing? So in general, I think look, it's it's clear that we need to do we need to enhance our uh, in our inflows in general, right? Whether it's exports, whether it's tourism, whether it's remittances, any other so, uh, services, exports, and so on. But that is that, uh, again, that's not going to address our immediate short-term problem. Our immediate short-term problem is really addressing this dollar liquidity situation. You can't go from exports from twelve billion dollars per year to twenty billion dollars per year in six months, right? So that's not really the solution that we need right now. That's definitely a long-term structural solution that we need. And there are six, there are a lot of measures that need to be done, and that requires a, an effort by both government and the private sector. It's good that in Sri Lanka we do have a, a national export strategy that has has been able to survive the transition of government as well. That's quite rare in Sri Lanka, and I think that's extremely positive. Um, and I think that does articulate quite well the, the different roles of the government and the uh, and the private sector. Uh, but what I would reiterate is that those measures are important in the longer term. But in the short term, it's what we need to do is regain access to global capital markets to address this critical dollar liquidity situation. Uh, thank you, uh, Desha. Uh, Kasuri, uh, I, an expression is to you. Uh, I don't know whether asking this question and your answer, Kasuri, will make us popular people, but um, do you think this tax that has been this two billion tax, there's a theory growing that it should be across the board that you know to be better if there's a surcharge and income tax where everyone pays a little bit of tax rather than one person a few people pay large amounts of tax. I don't know how you want to react to that question. I know it's not a popular question to ask, uh, not, a question, not a popular answer going to come up from you. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'll have to break a country point of view and and also like uh, alluding to what Desha yes. said. In the absence of um, sustained initiatives where we are going to get revenue increase or being more productive. This one-off tax is only for today, this year, right? And then what do we do next year? Um, 
I would have. Uh, so firstly, on the equitable thing, I think uh, we cannot tax the same people so many times um, and they are the ones who are driving the economy. What I would have seen is, look, let it be broad based for everybody. You want to pay a one off excess for everybody X percentage maybe, but you need to be fair. Um, and um, is there by doing this, is there are they getting any other benefits by to encourage them to grow? Uh, I didn't see that. It's just that, OK, y'all are growing, y'all are big, so you're responsible for the rest of the inefficiencies we are doing. But if you're taking this and putting this into tangible areas of uh, uh, where you're going to say it's going to create long term growth, we don't see that. So I, I'm not a fan of that, but I'm a big fan of seeing our tax base increasing. We didn't see that. We still have just a few of us, the, the minorities playing the tax. Um, the, the, um, there is, the tax base can really be increased. Uh, we, we, our tax revenue collection can improve. Um, we could have even brought the thresholds down a bit and got many more people into the taxes, tax regime. But those could have been uh, struck changes. Yes, I know it might be inconsistent to the mandate or, the, or the, what they expelled out when they came into power. But uh, they have to give do something which is sustainable. So I'm not a fan of things which are done as knee jerk just to put a plaster for one year, because once the one year is done, where do we where does the revenue come from? Uh, how are we going to so it, again? Remember, 50% of our revenue increases from these taxes, right? Uh, the two and a half is it's uh, they have to really think through because that's going to be a disaster for the SMEs and the smaller um, uh, margin trading companies as well as an uh, impact to the consumer. But the rest of it uh, from a um, uh, revenue uh, increase from the businesses or productive side of economic increase, uh, we need to get uh, get that sorted out. So I guess one thing I heard from Deshal and which we need to maybe the government can spell out clearer is what is that three or five year roadmap on uh, slowly re reducing the deficit where we improve our credit because the fundamental issue here is the forex right and today as larger corporates we see it and and smes have been struggling and the thing is the solution is not to say open an lc for 180 days or 200 days because remember with the pressure on our currency and and the the, the dollar appreciating in 200 odd days of what what how when you pay it your your profit gets wiped out and uh, if you saw the, the results of the last quarter for most companies they struggled with that with that sudden devaluation of the rupee so we we need to be sensible and get some ways of uh, a policy announcement so that um, there's some tangibility where the, the the rating agencies will see Sri Lanka has a plan I don't think they would uh, view it the one tax won't be viewed as a plan the window can I get one minute on this yes certainly please Savish. No, I think in fairness to what has taken place, and I hear uh, Deshal and Kasturi uh, loud and clear, but you have to understand this budget has come in in a year of uh, a, a, a world pandemic, right? And I don't know if you heard, Duminda, it's the COVID expenditure is a, a percentage of our GDP, which so I don't think any piece, budget... Yeah, any anybody has planned on this expenditure and uh, the government has not taxed the people for all the vaccinations and, you know, the quarantine and et cetera, et cetera. So the government has taken the full brunt of it. Um, so, you know, this this has to come from somewhere, right? Uh, so I think we, we need to have some uh, respect to that that this, this increase in expenditure has to be covered from somewhere. Um, so again, when I keep saying policy consistency, you know, I didn't mean the rate. As long the tax structure is kept intact, if they had to increase the rates of some sort, I would have had no problem. And I think overall at Sri Lanka, we are, our tax base is very low. So I, I think what I meant was don't keep changing the structure. Now that we have a structure, if it needs increasing, you know, the rates as you go, that's fine because uh, we are devaluing uh, our rupee and the expenditure is only going up. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, clear those two things. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Vish, for that clarification. I think from a chamber's perspective, also we have been clear on that. In that, um, uh, I think what Kastri was saying is uh, this tax system was quite what was in place was fairly good. I mean, not in the sense that it was fairly reasonable, equitable. Uh, the sudden jumps are the ones that make it inequitable and uh, difficult to take. So I think we are quite on the same page in my view. Thanks, Vish, for that clarification. Uh, so before I, I, I have, uh, Kapila has said that he is going to parliament. He has been asked on parliament, so he had to be excused uh, because the debate is uh, just started. Uh, so before I uh, come back to Vish with the final question, I have a question for Suresh. Uh, Suresh, this uh, uh, Kastri has mentioned this about the marginal relief, as what she meant was in our tax terminal law, this marginal relief. That is, if you are 1.999, you get away. If you are 2001, you pay tax. Uh, so, uh, do you think, how do you think they can marginal relief can be built into tax like this? Okay, I know basically this is uh, this is a daunting task basically, not only in relation to this one, this uh, issue is there in relation to other taxes or as well basically. So, I don't know I, how to basically address that issue, but uh, if you are, if you are marginally falling below basically, uh, okay, you are fortunate and yeah, one rupee above the level okay you are basically exposed to tax so that's uh it's you so that's so the policy you, basically yeah they, they should provide for, of course if they provide for relief then the whole taxing structure will have to be amended from what has been proposed right so first that is the answer to your question so they'll have to have different rates in that case maybe the progressive rate is only only way in which you can eliminate the uh, eliminate the marginal relief issue that you mentioned Actually, if I looked at some of the companies, they are, some are 2 billion and 1,000. <laughs> some are falling short, you know, that's, that's the luck of the draw. Yeah, and Duminda, like they said, look, we have to be responsible and be able, if the need is there, to, to fund it. But the other side of it is, um, every couple of years, this need would be there, unless there is a fundamental shift on actually purpose-led how you're going to increase revenue without uh, and successive governments haven't been able to achieve it. So you have to curtail per expenditure or expenditure or become more efficient on the other side. So this is this year. So I mean, I'm, I'm talking in the context of what happens next year. Yeah, right. So Desha, that is where the issue is uh, with regard to this. You know, we have always had what is called deficit financing, right? So we do the expenditure side and then decide what the revenue is going to be. So this has been a perennial problem in Sri Lankan budgeting process the last after 56 years. I'm sure the Shah will be able to answer that question. Am I right? That, that's that's I mean you can't introduce zero based budgeting to government, can you? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think it'll take a take a while. It's a big change to to make that shift. But yeah, you're right. I mean, typically what happens is you would decide the expenditure and then see how you get the revenue structure to to meet that. So that's always challenging. So what was likely to happen this year is that the budget has said that it's pretty much going to be entirely domestically financed, right? That means that it has to be raised through the domestic bill and bond markets, um, which means that again, unless the government decides to monetize the debt that it did in 2020, and in the last couple of months they have moved away from monetizing debt, uh, it does indicate that you're likely to see a further increase in uh, interest rates into next year as well. Thanks, Desha. Uh, Vish, my final question is to Chairman of Ceylon uh, Chamber. Uh, uh, and Vish, I know, always uh, looks the positive side of things. So, uh, Vish, what is your final message I mean, beyond the budget to the private sector and this forum? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we, 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 as private sector, you know, we, we have to work together. And I think we also have to pick our fight. Right. Uh, we, we need to make sure that we lobby for the right things, and make sure we also uh, hold the uh, government accountable on some of the things that they say they are going to do. Uh, we need to continue to lobby to make sure government waste is uh, reduced um, and their expenditure is, uh, you know, we, we can't allow government to get bigger and bigger. And the only way we can do that also is the private sector to become more and more efficient. Um, so these are the things that we have to do. And it's a, it's a, it's a work in progress. Uh, we all have to realize it's not only Sri Lanka. The world is going through uh, you know, extreme changes, uh, not only because of the pandemic, but uh, due to so many uh, different things. I mean, 
Um, all of you know the weather patterns are changing. Um, you know the the uh, whole concept of uh, digitization is uh, you know taking over. So a lot of these things uh, will be part of how we do things uh, going forward. Um, so yeah, I mean uh, for the coming year, I guess there there'll have to be a lot of uh, tightening of our belts and uh, see how we can uh, progress through this very difficult period. Uh, thank you, Vish, for the excellent remark. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings uh, to a conclusion our uh, discussion on the post-budget uh, analysis. Uh, on behalf of the Law Chamber, I wish to thank our chairman, Vish Pozisami, for our joining session, uh, take his valuable time and giving his input. I know Vish has been in fora from Friday to now. Uh, thank you very much, Vish, for your participation. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kapila Sirnayak, uh, who's not with us yet to rush to Parliament. Uh, I know he had to do what uh, he squeezed his time in between uh, and came for this session. So, uh, although he was not available for us to ask questions, uh, I want to thank him on behalf of the Chamber for his presence and giving the policy framework behind the budget. I want to thank uh, Suresh Perra for making the excellent uh, presentation and discussing the tax issues arising from the budget and the implications arising therefrom. And for Deshal, uh, who has always been part of our uh, uh, fora and even when you see at the ministry, is very helpful to the chamber, always uh, coming forward uh, and giving his candid and explicit views on the economic side. So thank you, Deshal, for your participation. And of course, Kasturi, our committee member, thank you, Kasturi, for giving this frank view uh, about what the private sector impact is and you know the country, from country perspective, how you look at it. And from business perspective, we have shared both sides of the coin. And uh, uh, thank you very much for that uh, very uh, educated uh, uh, presentation that you made in response to the questions I raised. Uh, so on behalf of the chamber, uh, I was want to thank Julian, the Academy, for organizing this uh, wonderful event, and also for Shiran and Manjula for putting the effort in getting this off the ground. So with that, I bring this session to conclusion. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, to all our participants for taking time to participate in this event. Thank you. The chamber will continue to uh, make proposal on your behalf. At the chairman of the taxation committee, I want to tell you that we are calling for a meeting uh, immediately, uh, maybe in the next week or two. Already, we have received submissions from different uh, uh, members of uh, of the chamber. So, wish what I have told him is that to set all submissions together, rather than taking one at a time, and then we will uh, look at the board and then see what we need to take on behalf of membership. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again for your participation. Thanks a lot. Thank you.